I hope you'll go along with this rather unusual setting and the fact that I remain seated when I get introduced and the fact that I'm going to come to you mostly through this medium here for the rest of the show. And I should tell you that I'm backed up by quite a staff of people between here and Menlo Park, where Stanford Research is located, some 30 miles south of here. And uh, if every one of us does our job well, it'll all go very interesting. We are born into a world of light and dark, sensation and emotion. Slowly, we discover where the self ends and everything else begins. As our world expands, awareness develops. As our awareness expands, the desire to communicate grows. Nuances are understood, but remain difficult to convey. Tools help us interact. The birth of the mouse was in 1963 built it on a, in a clunky wooden box about three inches by two inches by two inches. Douglas Engelbart wants to augment human capability, not replace it. I was interested in collaboration, really trying seriously to find out how to harness computers working interactively with a human to boost the human's intellectual capability. These big complex challenges have to be dealt with collectively. The big problems are getting more urgent and if we don't get collectively smarter, humanity is on a higher and higher probability of crashing. How do humans use the knowledge that we have to solve the problems that we've created for ourselves? The invention of the printing press unlocked information from the libraries of the monasteries and other places where books were hidden at the time and made them generally available to the public. That had a profound effect in terms of political, economic, and educational change during the Renaissance period and after. In the very early days, computers were viewed primarily as engines to do calculations. There was a group at MIT and a group at the Stanford Research Institute who really began to look at computers as ways to communicate as opposed to calculate. Back when John and I started Adobe Systems in 1982, we had an instinctive feeling that electronic communication would eventually become ubiquitous. We'd like to believe that the introduction of PostScript technology that made everyone have the capacity to be a publisher and a printer took that one step further and caused an explosion of the distribution of information that the original inventors of the printing press would never have thought possible. The most remarkable and important thing about media today is its ubiquity. It's invaded every space of our lives, but information is surprisingly hard to acquire. Between you and information is a tremendous amount of, of noise or static. Therefore, when people talk about information overload, I think what they're referring to is the way in which media gets in the way of information. Today, there's unprecedented opportunity to, to create, to communicate. But at the same time, the redundancy that burdens people when they consume media also burdens people when they create media. They become a blog that you haven't updated or a Facebook page that has been out of date since the moment you created it. The notion of electronic communication solving the problems of communication, I think is demonstrably false. Instead, what we have is an utterly human process of continuous breakdown. That's what makes it exciting. Cell phones have become ubiquitous. Martin Cooper invented them. People are mobile. They're fundamentally, inherently, naturally mobile. They don't want to be stuck in their cars. They don't want to be leashed to their desks. 
They don't want to be mired in their homes. They want the ability to communicate wherever they are. For over a hundred years, we in the telecommunications business have told people the way to communicate is to hook yourself up to a wire that's plugged into the wall. Today, it's not unusual to see people on the street playing a game, taking a picture, making a movie, or watching TV on their cell phones. What about the phone call of the future? Is it going to change? Well, of course it will. You'll not only talk to somebody, but you'll see them you'll be able to capture every nuance of expression, both in their hands, their eyes, their facial muscles, and that's gonna make a profound difference in how you can understand what other people have to say. Who we are, what we do, what tools we use, and how we use them is always evolving. The better you get, the better you're going to get at getting better. I think the thing that's fabulous about the internet is it opens up a whole new form of medium in which, in fact, interactivity is encouraged. Who truly needs information turned around in, say, faster than 24-hour segments? Hello, Joel. It's Marty Cooper.